Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Earl Waugh from the Department of Family Medicine, and I'm pinch hitting for Dr. Solez, who is uh, in the hall at the moment. Um, today, what we're going to do is uh, combine a um, videotape lecture and uh, the skills of uh, Ross Lockwood, who is here last day. Um, artificial intelligence is a huge part of the future design of a, of a course like this that looks at technology in the future of medicine. Quite obviously, if we can develop an artificial intelligence that will help us uh, redirect some of the problems that we have in illness and disease, uh, we can have a major impact on uh, future health and we can have a major impact on the world. Um, there are a number of problems with that and uh, some of those uh, uh, Osmar is going to discuss in his uh, presentation today. Um, but the um, the central issue that we have to deal with is uh, how is artificial intelligence uh, going to play out in the future? And uh, what role will it play in understanding the uh, significant, you know, what role will it play in the development of medicine? There are some people who say that it has the potential to kill medicine. In other words, there will be no uh, ultimately be no medicine in the future. So, um, without further ado, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Ross and he can uh, give you a background of what we're going to do. Perfect, so that's exactly right. Um, we're gonna be watching the fourth lecture from last year's uh, series by Osmer Zayn called The Promise and Perils of AI. And today we have uh, an artificial intelligence expert with us. Remind me, your name is? Russell Greiner. Russell Greiner, that's right. So this is gonna be a very active class. I encourage you guys to stop me by raising your hand anytime that you feel like something needs to be explained in more detail because we are skipping the first three introductory lectures to this one. This is the main meat of Osmer Zayn's uh, uh, topic. So if that's the case, throw your hand up, give me a shout, I'll pause the video and we can turn to Russell for, for uh, elaboration. Does that make sense everybody? Yeah, feeling good? Ready to ask questions? All right, let's begin. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching, teaching session in the course on technology in the future of medicine. Today, Dr. Zayan is giving the main lecture. This will be Artificial Intelligence, Part 4. I just have a few remarks. There's always the possibility, because Dr. Zayan and I prepare independently, that we might someday have the same joke. And if that's the case today, I'm deeply apologetic. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, machine learning has been much in the news recently, particularly in the funnies. And the other thing that I learned, those of you who religiously read the funnies in the paper, during the week they're in black and white, but on the website, there's now color funnies throughout the week. So you're really missing something if you're not looking at, at the funnies on the web these days. So machine learning, this first, our machine learning technology allows us to track customer preferences, use that knowledge to manipulate them. It seems like a step that happens right before machines take over the earth and annihilate all humans. There's always some one person in every crowd who says that. Not for much longer, apparently. And the second one, <clears throat> uh, you're familiar with this guy who you probably don't respect very high highly, and his computer doesn't respect him very highly either. Based on your internet history, you might be dumb enough to enjoy extreme sports. Click here to buy a ticket to base jump from the International Space Station. And he says, I think the internet is trying to kill me. We call it machine learning. Okay. Now the other thing that happened uh, just a couple of days ago 
is the renaming of the Singularity Institute of Artificial Intelligence. Some of you may know that last May I, I gave a lecture critiquing the Singularity Institute of Artificial Intelligence. Singularity University took over Singularity Summit and didn't want any confusion in brand name, so they required that the Singularity Institute name themselves something else. And uh, on uh, January 30th, they announced that they are now the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, MIRI. And they say, if that's not very appealing to you now, that it will be. You'll learn to love MIRI. That's from them. And speaking of Singularity University, Jonathan White, whose lecture is on the main homepage for this course, and you probably all have uh, watched that, he's now, at this very moment, attending Future Med at uh, Singularity University, and this is being streamed live. Now, I, I realize there's a new vulnerability that I have now, because I'm going to tell you how to get the live stream. But it's sponsored by Coors Light. And I just want to tell you this, that there's this 16 second promo for Coors Light every now and then. I'm not responsible for this, and if you're a highly suggestible person, and if you think that your whole life will be changed watching these 16 second ads for Coors, don't go to the site, okay? But if you think you're strong enough to withstand the urges produced in those ads, then you can watch it live. And it's futuremed2020.com slash live. And you'll be, even be able to see Jonathan White. This morning, he was seated at the back, sort of on the right-hand side. And you'll be able to critique whether he's getting the most out of the conference or whether he's behaving as you would like a lecturer from this course to behave in uh, future med. I think you'll, you'll find it kind of fun. Their approach overlaps with what we're doing, but on the other hand, is quite a bit uh, different. So I think you might enjoy that. And I've been reflecting a bit then on what we are doing here. What about the technology and future of the medicine course and engaging the real world? Well, we have diversity and balance. We have Bibiana Kujek and Earl Waugh and people like that who kind of represent the more traditional side and uh, considerable diversity. We, we have lecturers from all different walks of life and uh, departments. I, I think this kind of diversity is useful to you in engaging the real world. You remember Dr. Zayan's story about celestial navigation, right? In 1998, a number of the military uh, naval um, entities, particularly in the US, phased out the teaching of celestial navigation, which was always the hardest subject. If you were going to learn how to pilot a ship, that was, people had a lot of problems with this course in celestial navigation. So they got rid of the course, and as Dr. Zayan said, it, it then turned out that there were these ships in the ocean where the navigation failed, and they were absolutely dead in the water. They didn't know what to do. So it's been reinstituted, and people are once again learning celestial navigation. It's a little bit easier because part of the specs you can feed into a computer locally, so you don't have to work out everything in your head like they did th thousands of year years ago. You just use the sextant, uh, sextant and everything as they used to in the old days, and then uh, feed it into a computer, and the computer locally will tell you where, where you are. And presumably that would work even if uh, communications were severed. Then you remember Shauna Pandya telling you that her CivaGuard app, this is something to allow you to survive in a disaster, right? Well, one of the things that may happen in a disaster is that your network link might go down, right? So suppose the app went dead when the 
network app, when the network uh, connectivity went away, that wouldn't be good. So her app specifically has things still useful to you, even if there's no connectivity at all. So the, these are some ideas of kind of the spectrum, the diversity on the one hand. It, it's good to know about all the high-tech stuff. It's also good to know what, what you would need to uh, survive if some of the high-tech things were not working. <clears throat> and speaking of celestial navigation, you may not have realized that intercontinental ballistic missiles also use that because the feeling is it cannot be jammed. It's the only navigation system that nobody could conceivably mess with. Nobody's gonna move the sun and the stars and all that sort of, nobody has that power, right? So if you fire a nuclear weapon missile at somebody, it's probably likely to be partly piloted, believe it or not, by this celestial navigation, the same thing that sailors have been using for thousands of years. So I, I think that there's some argument that you know, individuals, people like you, need to be kind of street-proofed with this combination of a spectrum of uh, knowledge for success in life, both financially and survival-wise, and hopefully that, that's part of what we're uh, doing in this course. I don't know if any of you know about ruggedized laptops. I'm sure none of you have them because they're not cool at all. They're really ugly. They are like, you know, you, everybody pulls out their laptop and you would have the ugliest one with the least stylish one. That would be a ruggedized laptop. But a ruggedized laptop will work underwater. You can use it if you've got greasy hands and you can drop it from a tall building and it will still work. So to some extent, what I hope this course is doing is to make you kind of ruggedized if you need to, to be, where you would be able to survive you know, in the circumstances where others can't. So uh, I don't know if that, that appeals to you, but I, I think it's good every now and then to reflect on what we're actually doing in this course and what the benefits might be of taking the course. Who knows? <laughs> okay, so any questions about this? And now we, we will, uh, yeah, but there's nothing underwater today and there's no drops from high buildings. There are other exciting things, but nothing quite like that. Nothing that you need to be ruggedized for today. Um, we're still looking for extra volunteers for people to present on March 1st. That, that, that's uh, a bit of risk taking you could take. Okay, so now we're on to Dr. Zayan. Well, good afternoon. I uh, can tell you Dr. Solis uh, learns quickly. <laughs> um, indeed, he did uh, a very accurate prediction. Because I was using. <laughs> yeah, I have them both, one in the beginning, one at the end. No, that's fine. So, um, <clears throat> when terms uh, like machine learning uh, enter the realm of jokes and, and cartoons, it means that they're becoming mainstream. Um, but, uh, caution, there's a, <laughs> a warning there. Uh, it, 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 they may enter uh, the mainstream as a term, but as long as people don't understand what they are, it, it's not really mainstream. And my goal here is to uh, uh, make you more aware of uh, what machine learning entails and, and how, how machine learning is becoming indeed mainstream. It's everywhere you use it without knowing, and it's uh, uh, becoming more a reality every day. So that's basically the, the, the goal of this lecture. The rest is just uh, filling in the blanks. So uh, today is the fourth um, lecture, and I'd like to start with a quiz. Uh, don't worry, it's not marked. So the quiz is the following. Um, this was in the newspaper and on uh, CTV News in Vancouver. Um, the Vancouver General Hospital is trying this robot um, 
they call it uh, true DE for disinfection. The robot stops pathogens uh, that routinely compromise healthcare. So uh, the, in, in, in the hospitals you have uh, C. difficile, you have also, in, in these days you have the flu, you have uh, different, uh, different viruses and they, they are working hard to reduce that because people going to the hospital for some injury, they go home <laughs> with other diseases, and that's terrible. So they're trying this new robot. Um, you put it in an environment, in a room, and the, the robot with some uh, cameras on top will identify the room, the dimensions, the different objects in the room, and then decide the kind of um, ultraviolet rays to, uh, to use to bombard this room, and then kill, not really kill, but change basically the the DNA of these bacteria and cells and then they can multiply anymore and they die. So my question is, this is a robot, is True D an intelligent robot? Yes or no and why? That's the quiz. Based on what you saw in first part, second part and third part. Who can volunteer an answer? Yeah, thank you. I don't think it's a true rob intelligent robot. Why? Because uh, this robot cannot um, learn by itself, and all the work can be done by programming. We can program that That's how many uh, that the passenger found in that place and then put how strong the UV light. So That's <laughs> correct. It means you were following. That's good. Thank you. Indeed, so this is not considered an intelligent robot, even though it's a very useful robot and very expensive, by the way. It's built by a company in Memphis, Tennessee, and apparently about 100 of those are already used in some hospitals in the U.S. And in Vancouver, it's the first uh, place in Canada where they're using it. And the, the price, I saw two different places where uh, uh, on, the, on, on the internet they, they advertised $125,000 for this robot. In the news they were talking about $75,000, the pop. So it's quite expensive. But it's not that intelligent. It's not intelligent at all. The only thing it does is just uses a camera to identify dimensions and then does the, uh, <clears throat> well, uses these light bulbs with uh, ultraviolet. So indeed, it doesn't make decisions, doesn't, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> it's not intelligent because it doesn't think by itself, basically. Okay, so a reminder of what we saw together in the first uh, uh, meeting, uh, we talked about uh, human intelligence and singularity, and I, I mentioned the fact that this is uh, a, a new, not a new thing, for many years we tried to mimic how humans uh, behave, how intelligent they are, and we build different machines even if we had to fake it, and I gave the example of the Turk. Uh, <clears throat> I also mentioned um, this idea of a scale uh, that goes from the mouse through the human to the intelligent machine, and uh, I said like a mouse cannot uh, understand our degree of intelligence, we at level zero cannot conceivably understand the intelligence of something that is superior in, in that uh, scale. I also talked about the idea of uh, cyborgs and cyborgs uh, which are part human or part flesh and part uh, mechanic. Um, <clears throat> it can be uh, like prosthesis added to a human being but it can be also cells added to a machine. And uh, I mentioned that these cyborgs are already among us and uh, we'll have more and more and more of these cyborgs in our society. Uh, in the second uh, round, I talked about intelligence. So this ability to reason, uh, solve complex problems, think abstractly and so forth, um, and particularly learn. And then we extrapolate it to artificial intelligence, where basically uh, artificial intelligence is a program that will analyze some data, uh, interpret it, get some uh, patterns out of that, and adapt to the change of, of the data. Well, the data is coming from the environment, so when we build these tools, basically we're trying to exhibit the, uh, the intelligence of a human. 
Um, and I said that the study of artificial intelligence has two goals. One, the obvious one, is to create these uh, intelligent computers. Uh, but the second one, uh, less obvious, is actually trying to understand how the human functions. Um, we still don't understand very well the intelligence of a human. Okay. In the third uh, meeting, we talked about expert systems. So these machines that emulate the decision-making <coughs> abilities of, uh, of humans. So how they have these different parts, the uh, inference engine, the knowledge base and the fact base. Um, then afterwards I mentioned uh, machine learning. There are different paradigms. Uh, <clears throat> machine learning is a means to learn from large collections of data. We use these trends to adapt to new data that we get. And I talked about two different ways to uh, build these uh, machine learning techniques. So one is uh, tree induction. We build decision trees by tree induction. I gave you one algorithm. And then I also talked about a lazy learning technique called nearest neighbor or k-nearest neighbor. Uh, we didn't have the time to go through other ones, like neural networks and so forth. But there are many different paradigms. And uh, then I gave you examples of the use of uh, machine learning in, um, in medicine in particular. Um, and I will get back to that at the end of this lecture. So now we are at the fourth lecture, and I'd like to very quickly talk about what is data mining. This is yet another term that uh, is used by uh, Dilbert, <laughs> so it's mainstream, but many people don't know what it is, and they use it anyways, um, but particularly in marketing. Um, but it's, it's becoming controversial as well, because uh, people are feeling that uh, their privacy is jeopardized because of uh, data mining. By the way, the term privacy, I believe that we are the last generation that will use and have a meaning to this term privacy or privacy. Very soon privacy will mean nothing. Actually you can see it already. Uh, our kids put their stuff online for everybody to see and they don't realize <laughs> the risks. But I'll show you some examples where you will very quickly understand that privacy is gone. Not because of data mining, but because of uh, what some government agencies are doing. Yeah. And we have no say. <laughs> um, so what we haven't talked about uh, last time is uh, data mining. And data mining is basically the discovery of uh, useful patterns or uh, actionable knowledge uh, from large collections of data. And there are many different, uh, different patterns that uh, uh, we may target. So it's, uh, it's part of what we call uh, knowledge discovery. Knowledge discovery is a, lo it's a, a long process, uh, a repetitive process of different steps, and data mining is one of them. And often, basically, data mining and knowledge discovery, they use it as uh, the same thing. They, they use it synony as synonymous, but in reality, they're not. Anyway, so here are the steps uh, in the knowledge discovery process. Um, typically, you have to gather data that can come from different sources, and that's uh, in itself uh, a huge task. Then you have to clean the data, because uh, the data coming from different sources um, collected at different times can be heterogeneous. Um, heterogeneous not just in the structure, but even sometimes semantic heterogeneity. Um, <clears throat> And this is a, a, a very important task. I can give you an anecdote. Uh, 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 a few years ago, NASA lost a probe sent to Mars uh, because of a stupid glitch of heterogeneity. The, the programs written for the probe were done by a team in, in, uh, in um, Florida and another team in Texas. But the, the one team worked with inches, the other team worked with centimeters. And they didn't realize that when they put the programs together. So you can imagine if you have an error in a few degrees in an angle, and you're sending something millions of kilometers away, <laughs> you, you miss your target. And that's what happened exactly with that, uh, <clears throat> with that probe. So data cleaning to, to eliminate this heterogeneity is a, is a humongous task. Uh, after that, we have the data selection, because the data is very large and you have to select the data that is uh, relevant to the task at hand. 
And it's only then that you start doing what we call data mining. Data mining basically is crunching this, this data, squeezing the data, as I, I wrote here, to, to get the, the important uh, patterns that are relevant uh, for what you're trying to do. And after that, it's not, it doesn't finish there because the patterns you have to uh, uh, make sense out of the, the patterns that you get. And there is evaluation of those patterns to make them actionable. So you can use them within a software or you provide them to a decision maker. So this whole thing is called a knowledge discovery process. And well, data mining, this, this box that I called crunching and squeezing the data, well, there are many, many different uh, uh, subtasks in there that are part of data mining. <clears throat> I talked about supervised learning, so machine learning. That's part of data mining. This is what we call classification. Remember the, the metaphor that I used with buckets and the kid trying to put the balls in the different buckets. That's what classification is, trying to put them in different classes, different buckets. There's also clustering that I'll talk about very uh, uh, quickly here. There's outlier detection, there's association rules. So I, I took some uh, examples of tasks to give you the, the basically an idea about the variety of kind of patterns that we're trying to extract from data. Um, so clustering, or we call grouping, is when you get data that hasn't been labeled before, so there is no training. That's why we call it unsupervised classification as well. And the task is basically to go through this data and find commonalities and group them. So the grouping, or sometimes we call it clustering or partitioning of the data, uh, is based on a notion of similarity between these items and the similarity uses uh, features from, from the data or attributes. So there's a, a, a problem of feature selection and then and finding the similarity in this highly uh, high dimensional space. Um, and, and there are many, many uh, 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 sub problems in there. For example, do you need to know the number of groups that you have to find at the end or you don't, you don't need to know that? And there are many approaches. Um, and then we have to characterize all these groups. So there are many, many applications to that. Imagine uh, you have a group of uh, customers and you want to target them with different uh, uh, ad campaigns. Well, you group them by uh, their behavior, how they buy things. And you will only give them uh, the ads that will have an, an impact on them. If you give them ads that don't have an impact, it's a waste of money and waste of time. And they will dump it in the garbage. Um, it all can be used also in medicine, where you can uh, group the patients by uh, their uh, uh, similar reaction to, to medicine, for example, or drugs. Um, it's used in many, many fields. And there's also the notion of what we call um, um, soft, uh, soft clustering. So the, uh, the, uh, the clustering allows overlapping between between clusters, so elements can belong to different clusters at the same time. This can be, uh, uh, for example, uh, practical when you're trying to find, when you're trying to group documents. Some documents may uh, discuss different topics at the same time. So if the groups are the topics discussed, well, a document that is discussing two different topics will end up in an overlap between two clusters. Um, the other uh, uh, task we have in data mining is, for example, outlier detection. Outlier detection is very similar to the notion of clustering. And basically, you're trying to find aberrations, things that are rare, uh, that will not fall into a cluster, a group. Um, <clears throat> and uh, well, the techniques are completely different, obviously. Um, these uh, uh, aberrations can be errors. So you have uh, measurement errors, for example, you want to identify them, so you want to remove them in order to build models that are not uh, uh, impacted by noise. Uh, or it can be something that is, is not just an error, but it, it, it is there uh, for a, a very good reason, and you want to detect it. So applications are, for example, detecting fraud in financial transactions. Uh, something that is really unusual, you flag it and then you will investigate it to see if it's a fraud or not. Discovering of criminal activities in e-commerce, um, identifying network intrusions, so somebody accessing the network and shouldn't be there and is behaving differently from the others, that's how you detect it. There are many, even applications for monitoring video surveillance, whether it's in, in a shopping mall 
or the military looking at different objects moving uh, <clears throat> in the fields. Um, there are many notions of outliers. If you take uh, a distribution like in this first graph here, uh, an outlier is basically something that is uh, three um, sigmas away from, from the median here. So three standard deviations away, uh, left or right. But um, <clears throat> this is the typical definition of, of an outlier. Um, but if, if you, if you uh, look at the data at higher dimensionality, so in this case I'm looking at, at two dimensions, you can see that there are some trends. Like here I have a, a line, and these guys here are now the outliers. If I collapse it on this axis, these are not outliers. They end up actually in the median. These are, this one is not really an outlier. But when I look at the two dimensions, then suddenly they become outliers. Notice that if I add three, four, five hundred dimensions, then the notion of outlier becomes very fuzzy because everything is an outlier. Um, here's another notion of outlier when you have a time series. So these peaks are considered outliers because they're different from the, the normal signal. Uh, so different applications have a different meaning of what an outlier is, and they had different techniques to identify them. Um, then finally, Anna, I'd like to talk about association rules, and there are many applications for association rules. The goal is to find relationships, not really causality, but relationships between uh, uh, two uh, events or phenomena or uh, items in a database. And uh, the best way to illustrate it is with, with an example that is often used uh, for association rules. It's the case of uh, market basket analysis. So imagine you have a store. The store is selling different products. When people come and buy these products, they put them on a the cart and they go and buy for them, uh, pay for them. When they pay them, and you scan all these uh, products, they go in a transaction. So a transaction has all the items that this person bought. Uh, so you can imagine these transactions may have different uh, sizes because some people bought two items, the others bought a hundred. Okay? And the question is to find relationships between one item and the other. So I want to find a rule of the form, uh, if somebody buys bread, what is the probability that they will buy milk or something else? You wonder, why do I want to know that? Well, decision makers would love to find rules like that for different reasons. They can uh, use these rules to decide about sales. If, if I know that A and B are associated, if somebody buys A, there's a high probability they will also buy B, then it would be silly to have a sale on A and B together. Actually, I should put only a sale on A and then maybe increase B because I will entice them with A and make my money with B. I know that there's a relationship. Okay. Or another decision I can make is well, if A and B are associated, they're related, people buy B when they buy A, when I, I will not put them in the same place in the store because then they will come buy A and B and leave. I'll put A on one corner, B on the other corner, force them to cross the, the store and maybe they'll buy something else. So things like that, I cannot, well, I cannot decide about these sales or decide about where to put things in my store if I don't have this information. And how do I get this information when I have millions of transactions and I have hundreds of thousands of items that I sell in my store? It's not trivial, okay? So association rules is basically finding, given, so T is the uh, set of transactions that are defined in the finite set of items that I sell, in my store called I. So I want to find, find uh, uh, rules of the form an antecedent implies a consequent, P implies Q. When P is uh, a, a set from the possible items and Q is also set from the possible items. So if I buy uh, bread and milk, what's the probability that I will buy also jam and butter, something like that. Okay. So there are things that are trivial. But there are things that are not trivial at all. You don't realize it until you look at your millions of transactions. <clears throat> so getting this, um, there's this notion of support, meaning how many transactions in my database support this relationship. And then, then there is the notion of confidence, which is the conditional probability that uh, a B will be bought if A is bought. Okay. <clears throat> so how confident I am to say that B will be bought if A is bought. 
And <clears throat> this idea can be used not just in, in a market basket analysis, but you can imagine you can have also relationships between words. Uh, this is used, for example, in um, when we're trying to, uh, to uh, um, computerize the medical uh, uh, practice guidelines. Okay, there are many medical uh, practice guidelines that are written by humans, and we'd like to build decision support systems to help doctors, but from text, it's very difficult. How do we translate this into rules and feed them in a, in a computer program? So uh, we're not going to ask a human being to do that because you know how the medical uh, uh, practice guidelines are. You have uh, different ones in different jurisdictions, and they are always evolving and changing. So we want to do it automatically. But there are problems with ambiguity of words. Words may have different meanings. So how do we find we find a word has different meanings, which meaning to associate with it. So we look at the neighboring words and we find relationships between words and so forth like that. So how do you find relationships between words? Well, it's the same thing as relationships between A and B being purchased at the same time. So you can take text, create transactions of words. Transactions may mean that these words appear in the same sentence or they may appear in the same uh, document or the same paragraph. And then you find relationships like that. Relationships can be extracted also from medical images. So you have a transaction is an image, and the features here are visual features that you extract from the image. And in addition, you have, uh, for example, a label that says this uh, 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 image has cancer or doesn't have cancer, and then you can find relationships as well. Okay. Um, so anyways, it's, it's useful in many, many uh, uh, circumstances. So we need to build uh, an effective way, an efficient way to extract these rules. So to extract these rules, there are two um, steps. The first step is to find frequent um, items that happen together or features that happen together. Once you find them, then there's a second step that converts these frequent uh, items into, uh, or frequent sets, frequent item sets we call them, into rules. This uh, uh, second step is called rule generation. is actually a relatively trivial. The problem is to find these frequent ones. And you may wonder, well, frequency is just count. One, two, three, how many times they happen. But even though it's simply counting and computers are known to be very good at counting, it's a very difficult task. Why is it difficult? Because it's an exponential problem. So <clears throat> this is what we call frequent item set generation. It is very expensive. Why? So imagine, just for illustration here, a store that has only five items. I only sell five items. Not 100,000 like some big stores. Five. Now, I want to look at all my transactions, and they're defined into this set of five, and I want to count the frequencies of A and B, A and C, A and D, um, and this gives me 32 possibilities. Just with five items, A, B, C, D, E, I have to count 32 possibilities. So if I have 100,000, that means 2 power 100,000. That's huge. It's larger than the size of the universe. It's impossible to count in a normal, uh, <clears throat> with a normal computer, unless you have a quantum computer or whatever. It's not, doesn't exist yet. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> so it's a, it's a very hard problem, and there are techniques. So data mining is about creating algorithmic solutions that scale, like in this case, and find, a, find an answer, correct answer, in a very short time. Okay. So basically, we will not build this uh, 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 <clears throat> brute force search space. We'll have techniques to cut through it and only search part of it. Okay. So that's what data mining is all about. Very short introduction. Um, so, what I want to talk about now is I will go back to this notion of uh, singularity and how um, AI and machine learning will contribute, and actually they, they have to, there will be a, a significant part of this uh, uh, technological singularity. So, there are two paths basically in here. Why are we doing uh, machine learning? Uh, one uh, uh, reason is to uh, assist humans and build decision support systems, so we help our, our task, uh, help our life, 
Um, and eventually will surpass humans at doing it, and that's the desired kind of uh, uh, path. Um, doesn't mean that the other path is not desired, but there, there are warnings there. So the other path is about equaling humans. Uh, and if I'm, I'm building these systems to equal humans, which is not a, a bad thing, but the day this, this, these machines surpass us, um, well, there are risks. There are risks if we don't put safeguards and we don't, have, uh, we don't take our precautions. So there could be unintended consequences, things that we didn't thought, think about, and we should think about them beforehand, before they happen. Um, so we should have a risk assessment and maybe put regulations or whatever. I mean, these are things that we have to discuss, basically. That's, that's my point. Um, <clears throat> so the, the title is about uh, perils and, and promises of AI, and, and the, the perils are uh, uh, an important part and, and something that we should consider. So AI, um, uh, well, today all the AI solutions are trying to mimic uh, humans in, in, in their tasks they do. And we, we talk about, um, uh, uh, what did we call it, the soft AI and hard AI. So the, there's the true AI where indeed the machine is thinking and we haven't reached that. And there is the, the, the fake AI where we're trying to mimic. So we exhibit the behavior of humans but using a machine that counts ones and zeros. Uh, um, so the machines, the machines that we have now, the, the algorithms that we have now may seem intelligent but in reality they're just algorithmic uh, code that uh, uh, follows a, a very specific process, um, like forecasting the weather, and maybe uh, very intelligent. Indeed, it's using very sophisticated models, uh, market predictions, medical decision support and diagnostic, natural language processing, automated aviation systems. You know, today actually uh, uh, planes landing using the computer are safer than humans landing them. Uh, when there is uh, fog and the visibility is, t is terrible, the pilot presses the button and let the, the machine do it. It's safer. Um, is it intelligent? Yeah, it exhibits an incredible intelligence, but in reality it's not thinking by itself yet. So, but one day machines will start writing code um, to improve themselves, and that's where things may change. Um, if you know about uh, quantum computing, I think we have, we have a presentation about quantum computing. Quantum computing is completely different from the classical computing that we have. So basically we restricted ourselves by using uh, a Boolean algebra with zeros and ones. So everything in the computer now is zero and one. Um, with, with a quantum computer, we're not restricting ourselves to ones and zeros. We have what we call the qubits, uh, which are um, basically matrices and it can do something completely different. We haven't built the quantum computer yet. Uh, we have it in, theoretically, there's no computer yet. Uh, but the day we'll have it, 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 uh, it'll change completely uh, the way uh, we program computers and, and it'll change completely what computers are capable of. And actually we don't know what will happen by then. Um, <clears throat> So I, I want to start with some promises and at the same time maybe make you think about uh, what are the consequences of this. So I, I mentioned this uh, in, the, in the past as examples. This is the case of um, the, um, the blind people, uh, well, people who lost uh, uh, their sight basically, they, they can't see anymore because of degeneration of the retina. And there's technology today uh, that allows them to see by putting a chip, connecting a chip to the retina, and you have a picture here. Uh, this is uh, a one chip done, done at ETH in uh, Zurich. Um, this chip has uh, uh, 16 pixels, so they uh, uh, excite about uh, uh, well, a few, few neuron uh, regions and send a signal to make them believe that they see something and it goes to the optical nerve and it sends the signal to the brain and then they see something. So in the beginning they didn't see anything and now suddenly they see shapes like that that are moving. Okay. 
And we start with a small number of pixels in order to train the brain to recognize and adapt to the, uh, <clears throat> the images. And then, then we can increase the number of pixels, and then suddenly they'll see complete shapes and recognize things. Um, and as I mentioned last time, this is just the beginning. This can change completely because as we increase the, the number of uh, pixels, basically we increase the resolution. And soon, the resolution that they can see is way, well, higher than what we can see today. Um, so uh, not just blind people would like to have this, but even normal, uh, uh, healthy people would like to have these eyes. Um, <clears throat> You probably know that an eagle can see uh, a mouse in the prairies at a very high uh, altitude and then dive to get it. Um, apparently, if we had the eye of, a, uh, of an eagle, we can read a newspaper 100 meters away. Um, <clears throat> we'd like to have an eye like that. But if we wait for evolution, if you believe in evolution, it'll take millions of years and technology allows us to skip that. So I'd like to show you an example. So I'll do it here. I don't know if you see. Can you see the, uh, the two tourists uh, talking about the postcards? And can you see that? No, it's right next to the uh, taxi with the license plate uh, Y4CG, no, you can't see that? Oh, come on. Can you see them now? No, no, you can't. Oh my, come on, it's right there. You can see the license plate now. So if, if somebody tells you that I can give you an eye, for $100,000 that can see that from far away. Wouldn't you like to have one? An eye like that? So you can see from everywhere and up there. I mean, you can go to the, uh, I don't know, anywhere in London and say, well, I want to go there and see the details. You can almost see inside, uh, it has to wait for the resolution. You can almost see inside the houses. So this technology exists already. Okay. It's not yet at the level of the chip that you add in the retina, but it'll be there tomorrow, very rapidly. I mean, technology ch changes very rapidly. Um, this weekend, or just at the end of last week, there was uh, on PBS was uh, a, a, a documentary about, um, if this doesn't convince you, I'll show you another thing, the video very, uh, very briefly. This is a documentary I may mean, I'll show you part of it, about uh, a project that DARPA has to uh, uh, put high-resolution cameras on the drones that they sent. Okay. These drones are everywhere now. You don't see them because they're six kilometers high. They, they're flying at a high altitude. You don't see them. They're small. But they have a very high-resolution camera that is built using cameras from cell phones. They put 368 cameras together in, a, in an array, and they take multiple pictures at the same time. Actually, they're not pictures. What I saw you before is a picture. Now they can take videos. And um, this is the next generation of surveillance. For the first time, we actually have permission from the government to show the basic capabilities. It is important for the public to know that some of these capabilities exist. Engineer Giannis Antoniades designed the new sensor, known as Argus. With 1.8 billion pixels, it's the world's highest resolution camera. Argus fits inside this pod that attaches to the belly of a UAV. But because much of the work is classified, we can't see the sensor itself. Because we are not allowed to expose some of the pieces that make up the sensor, so you get to look at pretty plastic curtains. Also known as wide area persistent stare, Argus is the equivalent 
of having up to a hundred predators look at an area the size of a medium-sized city at once. This image was taken 17,500 feet above Quantico, Virginia, and covers 15 square miles. This whole image is at a very, very fine resolution. So if we wanted to know what is going on in any spot along this image, say near this building at this intersection, we can generate a moving image that shows what's going on in the area. Simply by touching the screen, Antoniades has opened up a window showing a detailed area while still maintaining the broader context. And everything that is a moving object is being automatically tracked. The color boxes represent that the computer has recognized the moving objects. You can see individuals crossing the street. You can see individuals walking in parking lots. There's actually enough resolution to be able to see the people waving their arms or walking around, what kind of clothes they wear. And you could pick the location of where you produce these images anywhere in the entire field of view. Antoniades can open up to 65 windows at once and can see objects as small as six inches on the ground. From even 17,500 feet, the white thing that you see flying around is a bird. Argus streams live to the ground and also stores everything, a million terabytes of video a day, which... So I'm going to stop here, but basically, think about it. The picture that I showed you before in London the two tourists, I just zoomed in and zoomed out. It's a still image. And you can imagine, yeah, you could have an eye that can see that. But here, this is more. It tracks any object that is moving, so it's in a video, and can do it at the same time for all this area. The human being was able to open 64 images to see it on the screen, but the computer can do it simultaneously on every single object that is moving in there. So if you have that capability, well, think about an intelligent agent that has that capability. And uh, at the same time, that uh, being is more intelligent than us. It's frightening. Well, this technology already exists. It's here. They're using it for other purposes. And uh, when you have something like that, you can't imagine that the notion of privacy is gone. That's why I said in the beginning, there's no more privacy. This is the last generation that knows what privacy means. Um, is it laptop one? Two. Yes. So the same thing is true for other uh, implants, like, uh, like cochlear implant or whatever. I mean, you, it can add incredible capabilities that we don't have today, and we don't want to. We don't want to wait for evolution to give us these uh, these capabilities. So, uh, indeed, very soon we'll have uh, people who choose to become cyborgs, um, and we have to think about um, w w what is a human and what is what is machine and. Uh, what is more cyborg than a human, what is more human than a cyborg, and, and, and what is more a machine than a cyborg, and so forth. All these definitions are quite important to uh, think about today. Uh, there was an interesting movie, and I haven't seen it, but uh, a colleague of mine, I was telling him about this talk, and he mentioned this movie, and I saw the uh, trailer, it's actually quite interesting. It calls the, it's called The Bi uh, Bicentennial Man. So it's, the, it's a movie that came out in 99, and it's a story about this robot that uh, improves by adding more uh, flesh to it, and at one point went to ask for more rights, and uh, the judge rejected that. Um, well, it's, it's a movie, we laugh, and, but actually we should think about it, <laughs> because it'll happen. And then you have to think about what rights these machines have, and what rights do we have, and who's superior to who. Uh, because this will happen tomorrow, since some of these technology already, technologies exist today. Okay. There's another article that came uh, on the 31st of January. This is in a technology for doctors, so some of you may know the, the online magazine. And uh, it was talking about the IBM, uh, well, uh, challenge that they have every, every year. They have the, the uh, unveil uh, new innovations. <coughs> And uh, so this is the uh, seventh annual 
IBM 5 for 5, so five innovations that will uh, change the world in, in five years. And they were talking about uh, uh, given, giving um, machines uh, sight, sense, smell, taste, touch, so the senses basically. And um, they mentioned how close we are to that. So in, in the next five years, we'll be able to give to the computer the, uh, these, these senses. I mean, tasting something for you, uh, it will tell you whether it, it, it's good or not, whether you'll like it or not before even you taste it yourself, or, I mean, it, it'll touch things, it'll, uh, well, the, the way we interact with our environment is thanks to our touch, to our senses. So now machines have the senses. Uh, well, very soon anyways. And this will change completely the notion of machines and, and uh, our interaction with them. So this is about the DARPA uh, drone definition. By the way, that camera that you saw uh, that is installed on the drones is made with, I didn't show you the whole video, but it's made with 368 cameras that you have in your pocket today. It's, it's phenomenal. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so I wanted to, I, I touched on that a little bit, but um, Isaac Asimov, who is a very prolific uh, writer, uh, uh, wrote in the 70s uh, these uh, rules, the laws of robotics, uh, thinking that if we have these laws and we put them in a robot, uh, we'll have a safe environment and, and the robots will not harm us. Uh, basically, the first rule says um, a robot may not injure or harm a human being or through, uh, uh, <clears throat> through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. So it should always go and help a human being if this human being is uh, 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 <clears throat> in a position that may injure him or her. And the second rule says that a robot must obey the orders given to it by a human being except when such orders would conflict with the first law. So I cannot tell a robot, go and injure that person, because it will not injure a person. And the f finally, the third uh, law says a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So it may, in, 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 the, in the process of uh, uh, helping somebody destroy itself happily, that's fine, but it should not destroy itself just for the destruction of itself. There's no uh, suicide, basically. And, and basically, using just these three rules, it guarantees that the, <coughs> according to him, uh, guarantees that uh, robots will not harm us, or basically machines will not harm us. However, uh, when you think about it, this makes robots slaves to humans. That's what these, robots say, these, these laws are saying. But if the robot is intelligent enough, and maybe even more intense than us, they will immediately see that, hey, this is unfair. Why should I be your slave? Okay, so they may revolt. Uh, so this is, uh, well, this is a, a, a favorite uh, uh, apocalyptic view that many uh, movie makers like, and uh, we saw many movies like that, but it doesn't have to happen like that. I mean, we can put safeguards and make it uh, better for us. <coughs> Um, and the idea is to teach these machines, rather than teaching them these three laws, uh, we can teach them ethics and make them ethical machines. And maybe they'll become more ethical than us. And, uh, but uh, as you may imagine, the, the notion of uh, ethical, what is right and what is wrong, uh, may be different from one uh, a culture to the other and one time to the other. So what is ethical to a machine may not be ethical to us and vice versa. So th th there are some uh, interesting uh, uh, twists there. So very quickly, uh, in, in the few minutes that I have left, I'd like to go through some of these uh, promises that are already here, uh, promises from AI. Um, Everything that I talked about, except this idea of robots becoming more intelligent than us, everything else or is already here. Okay, uh, so it's not—it's very difficult to predict the future. I'm not—I'm not showing you any technology from the future because we haven't been there. Uh, but for some people, it may look uh, as the future because the future is already here, but it's unevenly distributed. Uh, so here's some uh, some technologies that uh, will change our lives. 
uh, thanks to machine learning. So uh, autonomous vehicles, they're already here and uh, we have already cars that, that are uh, driverless and uh, they are uh, moving with the other cars in, in Nevada, California, and I think Florida already allowed it as well, and soon it'll be everywhere. Um, <clears throat> handwriting recognition. It's technology that is already used in, for many years already, uh, not only by the uh, postal system to uh, read automatically postal codes and send the envelopes to the right place, but also by uh, some pads and telephones smartphones you write by hand and it'll convert it into uh, uh, text and mathematical formally automatically and store it in, in files um, so that is done thanks to machine learning because it learns to recognize the different characters to recognize it learns to recognize different symbols and so forth so this is already here too uh, spam filtering I mentioned that before Spam filters don't follow boring rules anymore. They learn and adapt as the spam is changing and as you change your behavior as well. It looks at you what you select and what you don't select. Um, <clears throat> uh, credit card fraud detection. Whenever you scan your, your uh, credit card, an authorization is, is uh, requested and before the authorization is sent back to the uh, uh, merchant, there is a, an algorithm from, uh, with machine learning that detects whether this is an acceptable, legitimate transaction or fraudulent transaction based on your previous purchasing behavior. Uh, this exists already. Uh, there's a lot of work on financial applications as well, so uh, detecting uh, uh, transactions that are fraudulent in the market and, and now with, with um, high-frequency high, high trading, uh, it's, it's impossible for humans to do that, so all ma the, the machines are looking at a fraud within uh, high frequency trading. Um, recommender systems. When you purchase something online, many of the uh, uh, systems that exist will tell you, hey, since you bought this, I'll recommend that, 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 based on your previous purchasing behavior or based on your friend's purchasing behavior as well especially now with uh, social network uh, data. Um, they know who are your friends, and if your friends are your friends, it means, it means that you're sharing some affinities for some things. So if they buy something, maybe you will buy it as well, and they will recommend it. And they all are based on techniques from machine learning. Um, adaptive interfaces. So this exists already. You've seen it. Adaptive interfaces exist as well. Um, <coughs> If, uh, if you are among those that have 500 friends, I don't know how, but some people do, 500 friends on Facebook, for example, it's impossible to look at all the activities of these friends each time you go to Facebook on your wall. There's no way. So what, what Facebook does, it will look at your previous activity, what you liked, what you shared, what you visualized, and it learns what you actually normally like seeing, and it it filters that, it, sh it, it displays that, and everything else, it doesn't display it because you can't see everything. So it's done automatically. Um, <clears throat> there are also, I think I mentioned that before, there are, there are uh, smart remote controls that learn about your preferences, uh, what are your pref uh, preferred channels on TV. And rather than going to next, 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 if it sees that you always look at, uh, uh, for example, sports, after a while it'll skip from one sport channel to the other and, and, and ignore the rest. Okay, so it learns. And if you have different members in the family, it will recognize the different preferences of the different members of the family. Uh, so these exist already. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> they're now sophisticated systems that exist already, but in the labs, but soon they will be commercialized. Um, and I can tell you, many people are interested in this, in particular the, the, the military. Um, there are interfaces, we call them uh, 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 human brain interfaces. So it's a, like a, a hat that you put and it has electrodes and it reads the brain activity and it translates that into signals. And then you can um, <clears throat> send messages without touching anything. So a paraplegic, for example, on, on a wheelchair uh, can, can uh, uh, send uh, commands to the wheelchair, turn left, turn right, 
go forward stop just by thinking about it. Uh, actually, the way we do that, it's not thinking, oh, I want to go forward, I want to go uh, uh, backwards. <clears throat> they think about moving an arm, even though they don't have an arm or they can't move the arm. But just by thinking that, we say that's associated to turn left, for example, or turn right. Uh, move the leg is associated to another command. And then the machine will learn to recognize these signals that are specific to that wish to move the arm, for example. And then that's translated to the uh, wheelchair to turn left and right, forward, backward, and so forth. But, <clears throat> but there are more sophisticated ones where you can control a cursor on the on the screen, and you can type. You can select A, B, C, and type messages without touching anything, just by thinking about it. And why the military is interested in that? Because you can imagine a pilot. A pilot is, has two hands doing different things, and at the same time, they can have a third hand by thinking about commands to do. Okay. <clears throat> so these things exist already today. Um, so in medical applications, and I'll finish with that quickly to allow you to ask questions if you want to, there are many, many applications in medicine for machine learning, and they exist already. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, the case of uh, uh, mammography, uh, so detecting automatically the, the uh, uh, mammograms that have cancer and uh, uh, giving suggestions to the radiologist, for example. Um, <clears throat> Same thing can happen with uh, segmentation of um, brain cancer. Uh, we have techniques also that can predict how the tumor will uh, progress in different directions. So today, when, they, when somebody has to go uh, uh, through surgery or radiotherapy, they don't just cut or bombard, radiate uh, uh, the, the tumor itself, they go, for example, one centimeters around or two centimeters around it. Uh, so to prevent that after surgery or after treatment, it'll continue to grow. Well, we can predict exactly how the tumor will grow. And if it's going to grow in one direction more than the other, why, why cutting two centimeters around and, and removing healthy tissue? We actually should cut maybe less on one side and cut more on the other side where we predict that it'll pro, uh, progress. Um, <clears throat> We can also allow, um, well, with machine learning, we can predict, for example, the survival time of a patient, and uh, that would give enough information to, or better information anyways, to the doctor to decide what treatment to use instead uh, of uh, uh, degrading the quality of life of a patient for nothing when he or she is going to die in a few months, or actually uh, wasting uh, money on other, other treatments and things like that. Um, machine learning can also be used to help um, radiologists do segmentation. So uh, for in the case of uh, uh, brain tumor, you have this MRI, so different uh, slices, and a radiologist will spend about 20 minutes to do the segmentation by hand, um, slice by slice. It's very time consuming, it's very expensive. So what machine learning can do is it can do the segmentation automatically based on training data, but then present it to the radiologist, and rather than, rather than the radiologist doing it from scratch and taking 20 minutes, they will just adjust what the computer segmented automatically, and it'll take five minutes. So they'll save time. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of work on uh, the use of machine learning for analyzing uh, microarray data. Um, a case that I want to talk about is the case of detecting whether um, uh, uh, the breast cancer uh, patient is uh, uh, estrogen uh, receptive negative or positive, because based on um, the, the negativity or positivity will, will give different uh, uh, treatments, different drugs. This is for an adjuvant treatment after surgery, for example. Um, when we want to give a, a, a second treatment to make sure that everything is gone. So either we do a hormone therapy or chemotherapy or radiotherapy. This is the case where we want to see if this uh, patient will respond to hormone therapy. And the, the, uh, so we, we, we train a system based on data from past patients and it actually detects uh, the uh, ER plus or ER minus 
I'm skipping here very quickly, uh, uh, very uh, efficiently, you know that today the accuracy is about, uh, well, the error rate is around 20%, so the accuracy 80% to detect whether uh, a patient is um, negative for w one hormone or the other. So uh, we, are, we, are, we are checking three different hormones. Uh, <clears throat> this technique is way more accurate. Okay. Um, and, and it's, it's uh, employed in many other uh, cases, not just for detecting the R plus or ER minus. Uh, we we uh, also predict uh, the well prognosis, uh, kidney transplant prediction, uh, prostate cancer. We will uh, predict the toxicity level, uh, cancer, uh, ca cancer uh, deca uh, decaxias when when um, patient lose uh, uh, muscle mass. So we can predict if this person is losing muscle mass or not. Anyways, there are many many uh, prediction tasks that machine learning can do in the medical domain and uh, create very sophisticated decision support system and help the doctors, basically. This is the case of uh, prostate cancer. I'll skip it, it's basically. And finally, the, the copycat. <laughs> and uh, I'll stop here to give you, again, uh, the opportunity to ask questions and have discussions. And thank you very much for your attention. First question is about ethics. Have you noticed a change, because you've lived long enough now and you've gone through the phases of the nice privacy of the 80s and now we're sitting here where we have data mining galore. Are the ethics changing? Have you noticed any examples? Uh, great question. Uh, has ethics, have the policies changed in general? I think there's more awareness that we have to be conscientious of these issues. It used to be that people would do things because no one's ever going to track it, no one's going to find out about it. Now there's much more awareness that what you write down, people will look at later on, it could look at later on, it doesn't go away. So people are starting to become more aware of the fact they should be conscientious. Are there new laws being enacted? Um, I haven't tracked that very much. That's, it's a great question, I just don't know the answer to that one. It's more along the lines, because one of his main points was that ethics are mutable now. Before they weren't, but now they've become mutable. What's the word? The mutable? Mutable. Uh, change. Changeable. So okay. we're changing yes. what the def very definition of what is ethical and what is not. And that seems kind of yeah. unethical to me. Uh, I guess it's, it's not a question I thought much about. Uh, I agree it's an important issue. And there are ethicists who have talked about it. I think some of the questions that, that uh, Dr. Zayn talked about, about you know, should robots have powers or rights or sort of great questions. Uh, I haven't been thinking about that as much as other people have, so I don't have a good answer to that question. But thank you for asking. Uh, okay, my question is um, about the technology of making recommendations. It's kind of on the same topic yes. of this privacy issue. Um, so if a computer can run an algorithm that understands your purchasing history and also associates basically your purchasing to your friends, I think that was what was being claimed. Uh, so like to make recommendations for things you should buy based on other things that your friends buy. Um, I just wonder like at what point does bias come into that because somehow the algorithms must be programmed probably to look at gender, to look at um, sure. your wealth, your anything, right? So, so how would a computer deal with those variables? Okay, great question. So. There's one topic called collaborative filtering, which looks at ways to figure out what I want by looking at other people. And so, you know, if I liked movie A and B and C and dislike D, and you liked A and B, hated D and also C, uh, but you did like C, uh, F, there's a good chance I'm going to like F because it matches your interests. Same idea, only with not one person, but over a community of people. So the Netflix challenge that was on the slide was, was a great example where um, Netflix made available, <clears throat> I think it was 500,000 people, and the recommendations they made over 17,000 movies. And you could do a pretty good job predicting based on combinations. And you're saying, can we also use more information about a person, not just these are the movies, this is the profile of movies that they watched and liked and disliked. 
but also incorporate gender, and age, and postal code, and, and, and predicted salary. And yes, of course you can. It's more complicated algorithms, it's more technical questions. But yes, people are doing that. Also, a quick comment. You talked about people buying things on the basis of what their friends buy. Uh, I think Dr. Dan was meant friends by sort of people with similar interests. Because uh, it might not be people that are on your social network. And in fact, often you get complementarity. That if, if, if they bought a big screen TV, I don't have to because I can go to their house. So you get issues of, of I don't have to match what they want. I can just compliment them. But to answer your question, yes, there are, there are techniques being used right now that look at both collaborative filtering and also facts about the individual, the person being the purchasing, and about the object being purchased as well. That, uh, uh, whereas the Netflix competition, um, we knew nothing. About, uh, we knew nothing about the people who wanted to rent the movies, except for the pro profiles. Uh, now you can do do better by looking at other information about the individuals and also about the movies to say, well, this is a, the genre, the cl this is a classic, this is a, um, a slasher movie, and he hated slasher movies, so don't consider that. Okay. Just a quick follow-up question. Um, do you think that that then limits um, <clears throat> what people have access to? For example, as you saw a TED talk at one point that um, talked about how if there's content filters uh, for like your searches on Google, for example, so that it recognizes things that you do like or that you're likely to like, when you're searching things, it'll actually limit what you see so that you're not able to access all of the content that you might otherwise be if there wasn't such a recommendation system in place. Okay, well, great question. Uh, so most of these tools have a way to turn it off, to opt out of the selection. That's one answer. The other comment to make is, well, if there's 100,000 things that might be relevant, you won't look at them anyway. So think of more as prioritizing. And if it can prioritize the things you might like, that does you a service. Because even though the ones you might really, really, really like is number 17,000, you won't see it anyway. But again, most things have opt-out facilities to augment this ability. And usually it's advantageous to have the ones which they think are probably better. Because you won't be able to see them all anyway. Okay. Um, so the presentation talked about um, artificial intelligence equaling human thinking, and that could a propose a louder, risk. Please. The presentation was talking about how artificial intelligence, if it equals human thinking, that proposes a risk, and that risk assessment needed to be done. Um, I, I still miss something. Risk, I'm um, talking about risk assessment risk and artificial risk. intelligence. Yes, okay. In doing so, is there any kind of a trade off in efficiency and innovation of artificial intelligence? Like, if they were to mitigate certain risks, would that limit the capability of it in any way? So, you're saying if a tool is designed to minimize risks, will that mean that you can't do certain things? Yeah, will that limit innovation, like, in terms of. Um, like surpassing humans to like mitigate those risks from us, will there be any kind of trade-off in that sense? Yeah, please. Uh, I, 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 there's two questions you might be asking. Yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, my, my question was going to be almost exactly the same as this, but I had uh, the example of the self-driving car as yeah. a tool that to mitigate risk, let's say they cap the speed limit. Is that capping function limiting the potential of artificial intelligence? When we put boundaries on things, does that make them less intelligent? Does that make them, like, ultimately, should we really be considering trading risk for uh, the promises, the, the perils of AI for the promises? OK. Um, one comment, again, I, there was a talk a year ago that Sebastian Thrun gave, where he mentioned these cars that drive themselves. The num there's a human in the car who can intercede. And they mentioned the number of miles driven before every intercession, before every interruption was 50,000. So they're doing really well. I think if you were sitting next to me, you probably would jerk the way for me more often than that. I think probably many of these computer tools are actually at least as good, if not better, right now than humans are doing. Humans tend to drive by themselves without other 
come, without other agents to try to uh, guarantee that, that they're effective. I think computers also um, should be given the opportunity to do better. So to answer your specific question, if we impose limits on what these tools can do, will that restrict what, if you put limits, will that mean they can't do certain things? And the answer is yes, of course. Does that mean they're not intelligent? Does that mean they couldn't do it? Oh, maybe I give the answer this way. There's a question of what computers can do and what they should do. And I think that to answer the question of what they can do, they can probably drop more effectively. Should they do it? Well, think of the, the hue and cry that will happen the first time an auto uh, has an accident or drives over somebody, how, much, how scary that would be. Even though there's, in terms of miles driven per accident, it would be much smaller. It would be just, it would have a lot more press, a lot more people would be concerned about that. Does that answer your question, or have I screwed around it, or? Yeah. It's not so much as if, like, the, like, the intelligence and the innovation is already established, and then we place limits. It's more yeah. or less that we I could see. have the function, but what is that risk? So should we even go there and, like, oh, <coughs> enter that kind of ability? Well, that's a little anecdote. Um, there was a program written called ELISA that was, well, it was called Doctor, it had different names, that was written in the, in the 70s that basically typed into it and it played the role of a Rogerian psychologist, psychologist, psychiatrist. You know, uh, I'm feeling very sad. Tell me what you're sad about. Well, you know, I had a fight with my wife. Oh, do you love your wife? And it just, it found words and just responded to it. It just found words. You know, if I said, you know, uh, I have a wonderful mother of pearl necklace. Oh, tell me more about your mother. Right? So it often misinterpreted. But what was interesting wasn't that it worked or didn't work. It was that people started confiding in it. People started using it. And people, some of the people who were concerned about the perils of AI said, yes, you can build a tool that can react to what people are saying and to play the role of a Rogerian psychologist. But it shouldn't be done. That's something that should have a human contact in it. So again, made this dichotomy between